Why We Bleep is sponsored by Signal Sounds. Hey you, Sarah Davachi fan. Are you interested in making electronic music? Come right this way. I know well of a retailer able to provide fascinating and interesting equipment at a moment's noticed the drop of a hat. All manner of interesting electronic doodads can be purloined in order to make electronic music, be it drone or other. For not content with just stocking one single brand, Signal Sounds have the foresight to stock more than one brand, including Joe Mox, a hard man to get hold of. They've got the Alpha Base in your face, along with Tenderfoot modules coming straight out of Taiwan. The Benjolin finally has arrived, and they are very excited. It hasn't been available since Epoch stopped making his version. And then, darker than the sense of humour required to navigate 2020, it's the new grandmother and matriarch, Dark Series, from Moog Music Incorporated, are in. And finally, they have stock of the Mobula Mobula ROTLFO, which literally Jason sent to me because he wanted to see if I could pronounce it. So for your electronic music curio needs, head thy mouse clicks to signalsounds.com. That website is signalsounds.com. What's up, friend? Hi, hope you're well. Thank you for joining me. This is Why We Bleep, and we talk to electronic musicians and manufacturers. This episode is a conversation with none other than Sarah Davachi. I hope I'm saying that right. Davachi. Sarah is a composer and a music researcher, interestingly, I have become aware of Sarah Davachi because her music sort of straddles the electroacoustic and synthy world as well. She could be typified as being a drone artist, although that is, I think, a bit of a reductionist term. Sarah is, in her words, interested in extending and listening carefully. And if there's one sort of takeaway from this conversation, it's that to listen more intently, because you will discover fascinating things in the details. And her music is incredibly layered and textured and full of interesting details that if you are not paying attention, you may not notice. And and it's something that really struck me as I was kind of listening to her tunes and and sort of bugging out, basically. (laughs) I love repetition and I love droning things. There's something wonderful about things like Paul Stretch, if you ever messed around with that software, which allows you to take a piece of music and transform it to insane lengths. I think that's sort of analogous to what is happening in her music. It's slow changes and it allows you to become lost in a sort of a texture, a space, an atmosphere. It's astonishing music and it's very meditative in the best possible way, which is something we talk about. And Sarah, while she's sort of known for kind of synthy stuff as well, and that's how she kind of came across my synthy radar, Sarah also works extensively with organs and, you know, real, for want of a better term, instruments. She will do performances in churches playing church organs. Sarah is a music researcher and, in fact, has written a paper about ancient music technology. Sarah, when she was younger did a stint in a museum in Calgary that was a kind of museum of ancient instruments. And what we talk about, she talked about this in other interviews, but I think it's worth kind of hearing first as for some context. She would pick an instrument from that museum, which was not well attended because it was in a very part, cold part of the world and at the time not that well known. And she would each week sit down, learn about an instrument first and then learn to play it and get more out of it. And there is some fascinating hints and talks she has in this about that idea. There are instruments that are just lost. Well, not lost, but they're they're not played. So they're instruments that have, 
you know, just fallen out of favour. And I think that there is a really fascinating takeaway from this about how there are the interface, which is something that we think so much about in the electronic music world. You know, here's a new synth, here's a new gadget. It's got a funny squiggly, you know, ribbon pad on it. It doesn't have the same kind of thing that other synths do. And I think sometimes those things can be seen as a bit, why would you want that? And that's a bit silly. And I think what Sarah can teach us is that there's, there are, the history is littered with hundreds of instruments that have been discus- discarded and could probably teach us a great deal about other ways we could be interacting with instruments. That is an aspect of the future of music, is processing technology is so powerful is it not more interesting how we interact with instruments? Is that not something that we should be thinking more about? So this is a conversation with Sarah and it's talking about all those things and more. But just before we get into the conversation, we have one more sponsored message. Why We Bleep is also sponsored by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people offering thousands of inspiring video-based classes on a myriad of topics. There are classes for everything you could possibly imagine, from illustration to graphic design, music production, animation, creative writing. The list, it is long. But the classes are not. Most classes are under 60 minutes, with short lessons to fit any schedule. For a very long time, I have been wanting to get a good basic understanding of colour grading, the whole process in video. So I watched Colour Grading for Filmmaking, the vision, art and science by Dan Dan Liu, who is a professional documentary filmmaker and a cinematographer. In this, she teaches the whole colour grading process in a very simple, direct and basic way. And it's not just sort of how to use a particular app. It's actually the core understanding how to colour train your eye, compare images more objectively, and then a very simple workflow to correct match shots and then creatively explore different looks. So very clear, simple and well-paced. And it's a good example that I think for even for subjects that are generally a bit misunderstood, there are clear, solid classes that demystify it and teach proper transferable skills. Learning. It's a thing. So if you're curious to try Skillshare for yourself, the first 1,000 people who click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. So once you're done with the pod, click that and learn yourself some new skills. And for that, it's time to talk to Sarah Devachi. Thanks. I suppose the question is like, you know, from your historical studies and sort of, you know, instrument research, I guess, what, you know, what historical insights have had the greatest influence on your music? What would you say from the past has had the greatest bearing on your present work? I guess I would say that one interesting thing that I think you start to realize pretty quickly is like a trend in all facets of idea or development of ideas or whatever is this notion that whatever is more current whatever is newer is or more modern is somehow like better than yeah. what came before it that it's this idea of progress that you know the obviously the older things were not as good and they've improved on them and now we have something that's closer to what the perfect version of it should be and you start to realize really quickly especially with instruments that that's just not true um and that you know, things are different and that they developed with a particular need in mind or a particular narrative that they were trying to adhere to and that there was a lot of stuff that was lost um, because of that development. And so I think that's partly where my interest in early music instruments comes from is that it's just this wealth of instrumentation that, you know, didn't fit the model of the 18th century, the 19th century. And so they got rid of it, even though it had its own characteristics and its own um, idiom, Mm. you know. That's just kind of completely lost. <laughs> it's kind of the problem with the orchestra, I guess. Oh, do you have some examples? Like what sort of instruments and what what was lost? Uh, I mean, the, in the Renaissance especially, there's there are probably like, I don't know, a couple hundred instruments, I would guess, in the Renaissance that are just not 
used anymore. Um, instruments like, you know, like the sack butt or the serpent or the crumb horn, things like that. Yeah, all of these like, and a lot of them tend to be wind instruments because that was um, sort of the texture that people, composers liked at the time. Um, and then in the Baroque era, it kind of switched completely and people weren't as interested in wind instruments and they wanted these instruments um, that were, you know, more flexible and more um, emotive and dynamic, you know, which these wind instruments, which are basically on or off, you're blowing into them and you don't have any control over them in the same way that you do with like a violin. Mm. Um, you know, they were just gotten rid of because they weren't as flexible as string instruments or, you know. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't, they don't make a thing like the, is it the, uh, it's not a harmonium, but the organs where you have the sort of foot pumps, you know, where you and you can kind of allow enough air to fall out of it so that you can swell the. Uh, I guess they weren't sure. using them in that way, or were they? Yeah, no, and I mean, organs are kind of the interesting exception to that. I think partly because, you know, they're not that easy to get rid of. Yeah. <laughs> they're quite, like, physically, they're quite big. Um, although that's not to say that uh, so many churches just dismantled their organs and threw them away. Um, but as what happens with a lot of instruments, but yeah, um, I think also because they were built into spaces, um, that, you know, they kind of survived that I would say. Um, so yeah, there are actually a lot of organs around that, that still are very connected to like this mechanical way of playing in a way that a lot of modern organs aren't. Do you, how do you mean as in that they, they have facilities for sort of human, what swelling or, or what exactly? Yeah, well, actually, even there's an organ that I used on this new record um, that is exactly like that, that it has. Um, so I was playing it. And so most modern organs have an electric blower that just blows air constantly into the instrument. So you have this constant steady stream. Um, but prior to that, people were pumping air into the bellows of the instrument. And so this instrument that I was using is a really large um, pipe organ that had like, I think, four or five um, hand pumps, like big hand pumps. And so there was another person who was just pumping, going back and forth, pumping all of them while I was oh, playing. Amazing, yeah. yeah. And it's just, it's such a, and you can use that musically as well. You know, there's, um, because it's not a constant stream of air, you can play around with that pressure and you get different harmonics um, and a different sound. So yeah, it's just another um, way of playing the instrument that you just can't do on modern instruments yeah. how does it change when there's less air in it you know this, to me reminds me of like the things of um you know when they have guitar pedals that you like starve the batteries in them so they kind of do weird things <laughs> like what what happens in an organ when it's like starved of air uh, i mean it just changes the pitch material it's the same you know if you were like blowing into a flute or something and you were to overblow mm. um like more air than it needs it would go higher it would change the pitch yeah um, so it's the same kind of thing that when you have less air pressure, the pitch will drop, I think is the way it goes. And then if you have more, if you actually like pump it really vigorously or give it a good push or something, um, it'll make it a little bit brighter, a little bit more, um, more harmonics. Yeah. In it. So can you talk a bit about the museum as well? The sort of particularly, I'm interested in the, the instruments that you encountered and was that, that was kind of your was that be fair to say it was your first sort of introduction to those types of instruments and were you making music before then or was that did, was that also coinciding with when you became you know started producing music yeah it definitely was the first like real exposure to those kinds of instruments and it was the first time i mean it, it's funny because it kind of all coincided at the same time it was like me being at the right place at the right time in my life, um, where, you know, I was classically trained in piano. Um, I did that all throughout my childhood and teenage years. Mm -hmm. And when I was getting into my sort of later teenage years, I realized that I didn't want to play the piano in that I didn't want to be like a classical pianist, you know? Um, and I was becoming more interested in making music and composing music. Um, but the piano didn't feel right for that. And so I was kind of at this crossroads where I didn't, I wanted to do something, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the tools to do it. And then kind of around the same time I got this job, um, as a tour guide initially at this, um, keyboard instrument museum. Um, it's not, specifically a keyboard instrument museum anymore but um, for a long time it was when I first started working there it was and yeah I mean it, it was amazing because at that time also it wasn't really well known um, and it's in uh, a cold part of Canada that is um, you know like winter seven months of the year Wow! and so um, 
not a lot of people would be coming to the museum and I would just have all this time to myself and I, you know, I had keys. I was able to go in when I wanted to and um, I would just sit, you know, I kind of made it a thing that like each week I would go to a different instrument and I, you know, the week leading up to it, I would kind of read about it online or whatever and try to find out about it. And then I would go in and spend like a couple hours just getting to know the instrument, figuring out how it works and playing around with it. Um, and yeah, it was just like a wealth of, it was the best education in instruments that I could have gotten. I mean, early on, especially, um, and kind of at the same time again, I got equally interested in organs and synthesizers. I tend to think of the organ as being like the original synthesizer. It's like, you know, the early, the acoustic version of a synthesizer because they work in a lot of the same ways. Um, and playing them is a very similar experience. Listening to them is a similar experience. Um, so yeah, I got really interested in those at the same time. And I think, you know, I think initially it was just the fact that they could sustain sound. That was like the thing for me that I was like, oh, this is the instrument that I'm meant to be playing, not the piano, you know? Um, and then when I got into the mechanics of how you actually create sound and how the sound, um, especially on analog synthesizers, um, in particular, which they had a lot of, you know, this, uh, what would you call it? imperfection, a quality of imperfection about these instruments that is what gives them so much character and so much uh, richness in the sound. And that, when I discovered that, I was just kind of hooked on those. Hmm. Yeah, like synthesizers do have like 16 foot, four foot, two foot or whatever mm -hmm. on there. Yeah, it's like there the is model a model organ. Yeah. yeah. That's not a coincidence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a, And it's interesting that you say that it was to do with the sustain, like... I mean, could you talk a bit about there is a kind of the sort of qualities of sustain and drone in your music is you know, why, where does that come from? It's interesting that you were like, the piano just didn't feel right. It just was wrong somehow. It's like it, would, <laughs> it was already kind of baked in, but you hadn't discovered the instrument yet. Yeah. I mean, I remember, um, you know, like in this time right before I got the job, but when I was thinking like the piano just isn't working for me, but I want to make music and I don't know what to do. Um, I remember in the music that I was listening to that I found myself drawn to, um, like specifically a lot of classical music and like piano based um, compositions, I would hear specific chords or specific gestures in the music. And I would think like, oh, I, I don't want that to end. I just want to hear it and I want to listen to that longer. Yeah. Um, but the problem in so much contemporary or not even contemporary, um, so much like normative music is that it's based on melody and it's something that just it's it's meant to move horizontally to to continue over time um and move from thing to thing and it's not meant to just stop and focus on something um harmonic so yeah that was that was my main interest is that i just wanted to hear these things for longer and so you know when i found the organ i was like oh i can hold it down for hours if i want <laughs> you know um, yeah, that makes me think of the, yeah the um, is it John Cage? There's like uh -huh, that, the, yeah, the organ recently, thing. Yeah. yeah, of course. Uh -huh. I mean, that's like the ultimate expression. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so that's it, maybe a bit extreme. <laughs> maybe, yeah, perhaps the uh, I'd wait, like to hear the change happen. Not did it? Be is it true that gone? when they <laughs> fire that thing up, it didn't actually produce the first note for like the first sort of two years or something? It was like oh, I don't know. It was like apparently you know because it's the pause before you know the notes begin is part of it. So therefore, that has to progress for, for a while. I suppose the interesting you know, talking about kind of drone and, and just sort of, there's so much sort of texture in your music as well, where it's, um, it isn't just the kind of, uh, I don't know what my question is. It's like the sort of the fact that, you know, when you listen to something, particularly when you listen to sort of pianos with long, 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 long sustain, you get that kind of sympathetic resonance and there's a kind of, you can hear a sort of swirling quality. And so, I mean, do you think that you are as much, interested in the textural thing too i mean it feels like that's you know especially also because you're deliberately seeming uh, i mean i'm inferring this from just listening to the music but it must be all recorded to tape and it's deliberately kind of degraded to add texture is that is that fair do you think and is that as much a part of it yeah for sure i mean i'm kind of of the mindset that Every aspect, I mean, you know, certain details, nobody's going to hear. Like, uh, I think a lot of people claim that you can hear particular compressors and stuff like that. And maybe that's true for those people. But I think the average person doesn't hear that kind of detail. But I do think that with instruments, um, 
yeah, there's, you know, every component that you're using has some kind of quality to it that's going to add to the sound. So whether you're recording direct or whether you're recording to tape, it's going to it's going to have a musical quality to it that you can take advantage of. So, yeah, I do. I, I'm always thinking about texture and even, um, you know, I kind of got over my um, piano boycott, <laughs> whatever you want to call <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Um, for a while. Uh, and, you know, I think it's like you say, it's it's just the, the different ways that you can approach these instruments to bring out the same kinds of qualities that you want in them. I think, you know, I think classical or orchestral instruments tend to kind of be presented with this idea of like, this is what a piano is supposed to sound like, and this is what you can do with it. And maybe they do fit into those boxes a little bit more, but there's always, you can, you know, there's there's fewer limitations than you think on those things. I want the instrument to be able to do what it does um, as much as it can without me, you know, putting all of myself into it or trying to control it in a way that isn't going to be um, interesting to listen to. So, yeah, it's a bit of an exchange, but for sure, there's always, um, you know, there's always an element of trying to bring out this this other kind of texture that maybe you don't necessarily hear mm. when you're listening to something that's more, you know, temporally or like melodically driven. I suppose the other thing with organs, which is interesting to talk about, is room acoustics. And mm. it feels like your music is very sort of, um, I don't know quite how you've recorded it. And I assume that, I mean, with organs, there's no line out on these, you know, on a number of these ones. But so, but it, they sound very direct to me. I mean, they sound like they've been recorded to tape, but they've been recorded, to, you know, with as little of the room, at least in the music I've heard, you know, the various albums that I've heard mm. of yours, but that. Could you talk a bit about that, you know, the the way that you, partly the way you're presenting and recording and how you capture these things? And I suppose also it would be interesting to talk a bit about acoustics and, and rooms and what your experiences have been of, you know, playing organs that are built into cathedrals and, you know, halls. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, for the recording part of it, again, I, I tend not to think in like, this is going to sound better if I do it um, like this. I, I just think of it as like, it's a different way of listening to it. It's a different way of experiencing that sound. Um, and it just kind of depends on what, you know, at that moment I'm looking for in that instrument or what I think that instrument can do, um, I guess, more intimately than something else. And that doesn't always mean recording it closely, you know, to get a better sense of the instrument. But yeah, I mean, in the way that I work, it's kind of a mix of things. I'd say more of the organ stuff, the acoustic stuff is actually more room oriented. Um, I tend to like to get to capture the whole sound of the instrument. Um, and it's something that I've been interested in more lately, too, is this idea of, like I just said, inst intimacy at a distance, if you know what I mean. Um, like being able to hear something as being intimate, but understanding that it's happening, you know, in another room or at some kind of distance from you, as opposed to having it be right in your face. I think that's an interesting production trick that is fun to work on and that I think sounds interesting. But, you know, when I do stuff, you know, if I've recorded something and then I go to overdub it in my studio, um, often I, I mix those things as sounding a bit more intimate, um, a bit more direct. And that's another thing that I like doing is playing around with this idea of space in the actual recording is, you know, having things that are at a distance and things that are a little bit nearer and having it be this space that isn't really um, part of reality mm. in any normal way, you know, that you can't really imagine how it would play out acoustically. Um, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, with organs, you know, it's, it's interesting to try to record them and to, to put them into that context because it is, again, it's just such a different way of listening to the instrument um, in a way that I don't think most other instruments fall into that category. Like I think when you, you know, when you listen to a piano live and when you listen to it on a record, I don't think there's quite as much disparity um, or disparity. I don't know. It sounds pejorative and I don't mean it that way. I just mean like there isn't as much variety, I guess. Mm um and how you hear those two things and what's amazing about organs in particular is that they can serve one purpose on a record on a recording and be intimate in this very like headphony kind of way but then when you listen to them live it's just a completely different experience you know it's it's just a very different sound and then one step further from that is actually playing them live is a completely different sound than actually sitting out in the audience and hearing them and that's what's kind of fun about playing organs is that you're getting 
sort of a unique performance for yourself and you're getting a different way of hearing the instrument. It's, uh, it's really interesting, that idea that it might not sound best to the person playing it. I mean, that's, I suppose, is a common thread. If you've have ever performed live, it's quite, you know, my experience is always like, you always kind of get the second rate version of the, the music you're playing and the audience gets the best version of it, you hope. Mm. But um, I think it's particularly interesting thinking about the way that organs historically will have been constructed for specific spaces. And it's that idea that you cannot separate that organ from its space. So it's in a sense that the you know um, the space itself is part of the organ. I think that's a really interesting, poetic and sort of literal, actual physical um, element to these things. That you know the the church itself is part of the sound. That's nuts. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. how it must change when there's a, a congregation versus when there isn't. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a really fascinating thing. And that's what I try to do that, um, to kind of take advantage of that when I play organ shows, um, like live, you know, there are certain things that I'll cross over, like certain gestures and things that I like working on, on all organs. Um, but I try to compose specifically for each organ because it is a different instrument and it is a different space and it's just, it, it's never going to line up one-to-one from one organ to another, mm. you know? So in my opinion, you might as well, take advantage of that um, difference between them and and use it. So can we talk a bit about sort of pro- approaching projects? Like I suppose, you know, thinking of like your new album, Cantus Descant, or I was listening to Gathers as well. And it's sort of this, mm. I think if I'm right in thinking it was like on Gathers, especially this is also going by the handy description on Bank Count where it's taught, where you sort of you actually explain a bit about what each track is constructed from and you can kind of see in that album, for example, that each track is like inspired by one instrument, you know. And so I suppose mm. my question is like what sort of thoughts and structures do you have before a project goes ahead goes ahead? Um, and kind of how would you declare that something is done as well? I, especially in the last, like, maybe four, five years, I have specifically thought of different projects or albums specifically as albums. So I, I always come to it with that in mind, that it's a it's a cohesive thing from the beginning, that I know the general feel of the album and I know what I want it to be on a very, like, surface level, you know? Yeah. Um, so when I'm planning it, it's always with that in mind when I'm thinking about what instruments I want or how the different pieces are going to relate to each other or how each of them are going to sound. Um, yeah, it's always in this, under this umbrella of the album, but it also, I mean, it varies so much. I think I feel lucky to be a keyboard player because I think, um, you know, the keyboard is an interface. It's not really an instrument. It's just a thing that's been added to a lot of different instruments. And um, I think it's given me the advantage of being able to have access to a lot of different types of instruments and not just instruments, you know, that use the same kind of playing technique, like a a harpsichord, for instance, which is maybe a bit more akin to like the way a guitar works. Mm but then also being able to translate it to organ, which is like a woodwind instrument, basically. Um, It's just a bunch of pipes put together, you know? Um, So yeah, I tend to think of things in terms of, um, like from a structural perspective, I tend to think of things in terms of like focusing on specific techniques or specific instruments um, with each album and kind of taking advantage of what I can in those, which I think is interesting. Could you describe sort of working on tracks? Like how would you... um you know, on a say, you know, on Cantus Descant, like how would you approach the pro is the process of recording a track done as like one single pass? Are you multi-tracking these things? You know, how does it work? How what's the process? Yeah, I mean again it it varies. Um, maybe not a lot, but it varies a bit. I would say on this album in particular, there are more tracks than probably I've had on any other album that are like just straight direct recordings. Um, and I think that's specific to the fact that they were done in live spaces and they were organs, so they had to be done in live spaces. And so it was just this idea of being able to play the instrument and just capture the sound in the room. There's, um, yeah, there's a handful of those on this record. But then the rest of the record is pretty similar to the way that I work, regardless of what instrument 
or instruments I'm starting with, um, which is, yeah, basically just to gather different recordings. And in my mind, you know, acoustics and electronics are not really any different. They're just two different types of instruments, but I approach them in a very similar way. So yeah, I just gather a lot of different sounds. Usually a lot of what I start with comes from improvisation, just playing around and seeing what I find that I like and kind of developing it from there um, and actually getting it on paper and then recording it. And then, yeah, it can get really deep into like a multi, multi-tracking, multi overdubbed, processing kind of thing. Like I have a very particular way of being like, okay, I'm going to listen to this. And when I'm happy with it, then I'm going to move on to the next thing. But if there's something in it that just doesn't feel like it's working, I need to go back and change that. Like I, I don't like to, you know when something's working and you know when it's not. And so when something feels off, I like to go back and just keep reworking it until that feels okay. And then it's the same process with everything that I add onto it, where I'll add something and I'll listen to it for a while and think, it sounds okay, or no, it just still sounds off. And I'll just keep working on it until it starts to get to where I want it to. Um, Yeah, and it's just a continuous process of that, of, you know, playing around and adding to things and working on them. Um, And usually, you know, once a piece starts, I have a pretty good idea of how I want it to sound in the end and what I need to do to get it there so it's pretty usually it's pretty clear to me when something is finished you know usually at the end of it I can say like I don't think that needs anything else or you know it's that part of it's never really been hard I know it's hard for some people to know when something's finished Mm. but it's never really been a problem for me it's good I don't know why yeah (laughs) Yeah. do you and so you what you actually do you're writing notation for these um or is it done within the digital realm yeah, no, there's, I mean, um, there's the, the, basically the only stuff that I actually take the trouble to notate, because um, I don't think notation makes a lot of sense, like traditional notation makes a lot of sense for my music, um, partly just because of the way that the pacing and that timing is done in scores. Um, so the only time I'll do something um, that's an actual score is if I'm writing something for other people, um, mm. or if you know it's for a performance or something like that. Uh, but everything else is um, is just handwritten notes. So it'll just be like a page of, you know, writing out notes and like actual musical notes and then writing out notes about it and different things by hand um, and doing that. I always, I do everything by hand mm. first you, and then... Do you do like yeah. a visual score, like sort of in the, you know, the grand sort of tradition of visual scores, but you know what I mean? Like just to help understand the dynamics and how things will change over time. Yeah, no, I don't. I've never really latched on to um, that idea of of visual scores or like alternative scores. Um, Yeah, for me, it's usually just like handwritten notes. Um, I think maybe the way that like a producer would work, you know, where you'd have some sort of like sketch of the way things are in the terms of like layers of tracks Mm. of things, you know, and knowing where things are going to come and go and then just being able to mix it visually is enough for me. Um, on my computer but yeah it's usually the notes are you know just like they wouldn't make sense to to anyone else yeah yeah no um and so can you talk a bit about sort of i suppose simplicity and complexity is a question because it's um you know which there are lots of facets to i mean the reason i was thinking about this was listening to hours hours in the evening from let the Mm. night come on bells end the day uh, get that right um but there's that piece of music is really compelling and it's the what what i found really interesting about it is there's it's not a, you can tell there's like m- multiple or it sounds to me like there's many many layers of a composition you know it's like there's a, you know at least three track you know three part multi-track mm-hmm. but then it's been low passed to like a really large extent so it's kind of i can hear I can hear almost like a muffled version of the things that are in the background, and I'm, and I, which which lends this kind of far away sort of quality to them. And it, uh, you know, on one level, if you listen very superficially, you would say, "Oh, it's just a drone." But then, if you listen carefully, you can hear that you can still hear all of those layers, but they're kind of they're slightly hidden, like you're looking through sort of stained glass or something. And it's, Hmm. you know, which I thought was interesting. What I'm getting at is that it's, you know, on the face of it, very simple, but 
actually a very complicated, you know, there's a complex arrangement with multiple parts, I think, you know, as far as I could hear properly. Yeah. There's like, well, there, mul- is, yeah. Yeah, well, there are multiple parts playing and it's, um, and particularly also talking about the idea of like multi-tracking, it would be interesting if you, if you could talk a bit maybe about that piece, like, you know, I as a musician, if I was making, you know, a piece, I don't think I would ever have I'm not clever enough to have like <laughs> filtered it to that degree. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, and it's that sure. idea of it being a bit like a sort of Rothko, or, you know, where it's like many, many layers huh. are like building up uh-huh. this kind of texture. Yeah. I mean, I don't know where that interest of mine came from to like really get into like details of things. I think, you know, it's what I like listening to when I hear things. And even when I listen to like pop music or whatever, I can't help but hear details in, in the production and and arrangements and everything. Um, So I think my ears are just, they like hearing that anyway. Um, But yeah, that track, I don't remember specifically now how many tracks there are on it, but yeah, I think there's something like three or four, um, but that track is kind of interesting because the majority of my music, yeah, I'd say the majority of it still is very like studio based music that I wouldn't know how to perform live and that I'm not really interested in figuring out how to perform live because I like them existing, you know, as a recorded mm-hmm. version. That's what they're meant to do. Um, there have been a handful of tracks that come from the opposite direction that come from a live performance. And then, you know, it's something that I like. So I figure out how to pare it down to a sort of recorded version or studio version. And that's one of those tracks that started as a live performance. So Mm -hmm. the, the actual version of that track is like, you know, 45 minutes or something. And it's just that it's the same thing, but stretched out over 45 minutes. So yeah, I hear it a little differently when I hear the recorded version. Um, not because I think anything's happening too fast, but it's just to me, it's a different piece and it you get into it in a different way. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I even do that actually in the live versions of things that I do. I'm like that annoying person who's always asking the uh, sound engineer to you know completely cut out my highs and they don't understand why I want to do that <laughs> or why anybody would want to do that. And sometimes I have to lie and be like, oh, you know, I, I don't I don't even really use high frequencies, which is not even really true. Um, but it's just that that muted quality of it um, is something that I don't know. I think it just forces you to listen a little bit closer. It's almost like a trick of pulling, you know, when you're not given it, like you said, like with stained glass or something, when you're not given um, the full picture or as many details, you have to stop and, and look at it a little bit closer and pay more attention to to hear what's going on. Or you can not do that and then you just miss it completely. Um, like you said, with people who just see it on like a surface level and think of it as like a drone, um, which unfortunately there's no shortage of. Yeah, of course. It's a very polarizing type of music. Not I find that there are a lot of people who don't like listening I do to. Do find it. that surprising? I sort of yeah, like I kind of I understand why people would say that, but I also I think it you know which I mean this is going to sound wrong, but I you know I almost because this is this is almost the B five with Spotify where like music is is designated for purposes you know versus mm. being for the you know for its own merits. It's like you know music to jog to or music to, but I think. You know, I do think that that type of music does have a very powerful role and, and you know, for for entering kind of meditative states, you know, it's a way, it's almost a way of practicing meditation for people who are probably less inclined to do it because it's, I don't see a huge difference between focusing on your breath versus focusing on, you know, hours in the evening for mm. 20 minutes, like, carefully and and just really focusing on listening to that music i i do not see how it is in any way different to um meditation Hmm, i appreciate you saying that yeah um yeah i mean it's hard for me to have an opinion on it because it's i can't imagine feeling a different way you know yeah um because it's just how i listen and what i want to listen to Um, when I make music and for me it's very much that function of you know having this way of like slowing myself down and um, you know having music be that sort of um, you know that uh, vessel or whatever you want to call it for getting into that state of mind Um, it's really useful for me in that way but yeah I think you're right about the Spotify thing Um, you know just streaming in general that it's so 
low stakes and it's so, you know, people need that immediacy. And if something doesn't pop at them right away, unless it's something that they know they want to listen to, they're not going to wait 30 seconds mm. for something to fade in. You know, they're just going to move on to the next thing. So yeah, there are tracks, yeah. there are tracks of yours that literally are, yeah, like 30 seconds. Of fading. Oh yeah. That's <laughs> Kids uh, are deaf, are the shorter end of yeah, yeah. <laughs> things I would say. It'd be interesting to talk a bit about the studio and stuff and like, you know, what on two fronts, like, you know, A, I suppose I'm interested to know, I haven't really seen, you know, like I saw some of an article about your studio, but um, could you describe if I was in your house, what would your studio, if your studio was in your house, which I assume it is, but what does it look like and how is it arranged and how is it sort of, how have you changed it over time, you know, as you've worked more and more with the equipment you know what do you how have you refined it to to make it perfect for yourself and and then also kind of how do you use it if you're talking about using this stuff as a kind of as a sort of state altering thing do you what do you do when you sit down how does it work yeah well i'm in my studio right now so <laughs> it's very easy to describe um yeah i mean it's funny because um I've had this studio set up, I guess, for like three years now, for as long as I've been living in Los Angeles. Mm. Um, and before that, uh, I had a period like probably a year and a half where I was kind of in between places, jumping around from place to place. And I had most of my gear and instruments in storage. Some things were like split in different cities across the country in Canada, um, which was just like a really horrible way to live because I didn't have, you know, I, I didn't have anywhere that I could go to like rely on for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so just having a space to have a studio is really important for me to, um, I don't know, to just feel like I have some kind of grounding. I hate that word, uh, <laughs> but some kind of grounding on, on what I'm doing and what I'm able to do when I'm feeling like making music. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have it, it's not a very big room, but, um, it's like a child's bedroom, but, um, you know, I just have my desk with my speakers and, uh, interface and all that set up. Um, and then in my actual studio proper, I have all of the instruments that I use on a more regular basis set up. So like my main setup in one corner of the room, I have the, I use the digital Mellotron, the M4000, mm -hmm. I think it is, that Mellotron made. I use that quite a lot. And I have a, an electric organ. Um, it's a Korg CX3 that is like an analog version of a Hammond B3 simulator. So it's just basically like a... Um, you know, a much lighter, <laughs> much cheaper mm. version of a Hammond B3. Um, and then I have uh, a couple organs, a couple harmoniums set up. I have my Nord set up, which is what I tour with. But I do use it sometimes for certain things, maybe not so much on records, but for other things, you know, if I'm recording piano or something like that, it's easier to just go direct and use that rather than actually setting up a mic on my own piano. And then I have all of my synthesizers, which I spent a long time collecting, um, all set up in various ways. And then my studio kind of spills out into the rest of my house. I have a harpsichord in the hallway behind my studio and, you know, like an upright piano and other things kind of sitting here and there. But right now I'm working on a new record right now. So I have uh, all of that set up specifically for that so i can just you know pr turn it on and hit record basically which i wouldn't normally be able to do if i was touring because i'm using you know pedals and things like that that i would take on tour normally so that's actually been nice for working on a record that i can just really set everything and not have to undo it and put it back together mm. but you have specifically chosen like a set of gears you know it's like these five things and these you know, X number of pedals, this is it. You don't sort of think, oh, it'd be nice to have a bit of harpsichord on this and kind of go out into the hallway. Do you know what I mean? Do you, are you quite disciplined in that sense? Yeah. I mean, yes and no. This record actually does have harpsichord on oh, right. it. Okay. So okay. I do have a mic set up with my harpsichord so I can record it and I've been tuning it and stuff. But yeah, I mean, there, like with this record in particular, there were certain instruments and ways of working that I wanted, like you said, I, that, you know, I kind of wanted to limit myself to and have this record um, be a way of working on those. But of course, like, you know, when certain things aren't working, um, I look around and I think, okay, what else can I do? What what can I use here to make it better? I don't, when, again, you know, as I said, you know when things are working and you know when they're not. So when they are working and you're still within those limitations, that's great. You can, you know, go to town on it and do what you want. 
Um, but when it's not, I think you're, anybody would be doing themselves a disservice to just be like, no, I need to stick to these things and these things only rather than just being like, okay, this isn't working. Let me go see what else I can do or what I can throw in and change to make it work better. How much gear would you say is too much? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm not the right person <laughs> to make that decision because I don't know. I'll always find an excuse or find room for something <laughs> if I really want it. I don't know. I mean, the things that I collect are, they fall pretty cleanly into two categories of things that I use, things that I like using, things that I think sound cool, um, and things that I find like historical interests or value mm. in, but that I don't necessarily use that much on my own music. So yeah, I'll always, I'll always find that, but there is, um, you know, I, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have like a problem. I know, I know a lot of people <laughs> who have a lot more gear than I do. So oh, yeah. I don't think it's an issue for me. I mean, all of the synthesizers, I use them on records from time to time, but I don't, you know, most of them I wouldn't have been able to tour with anyway. Some of them I did used to take on tour, but they've since been retired for the Nord just because it's like way too stressful and they're too fragile and you know just it's it's not they're not things that you tour with anymore unfortunately um but i mean the more like historic things that i don't hang on to them just because they're historic i do like playing them and I, they're instruments that i love but um like i have an ems synthy aks um that i used to tour with <laughs> which is ridiculous uh that you know i use i used on that gathers tape and um i've used it on yeah. some records from time to time that is a particular instrument I singled out. That and the Synthi 100 to talk about. Why do you have it? And what for you? What what does it represent? And what what do you get from it? Yeah. Well, so I will say that the Synthi 100 that I used on Vergers um, that actually belongs to a friend, a collector, um, Richard Smith, who's like a tech and collector um, who lives up in Canada. Um, so he has that in his house, and that's the one that I used. Um, that one's not mine. That that's much beyond my means. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's too much for me. It's um, like, yeah, it is next level. That's extreme. I remember when he bought it, um, he had to have it uh, craned into his apartment because it's basically just two pieces. Like the top, the instrument part is a single piece. It doesn't come apart, you know, so it wouldn't fit through a door. Oh uh, yeah, so he had to crane it in. Anyway, um, but the Synthi AKS, which is the, the much smaller more manageable uh, it was meant to be portable you know when it mm. was first made um that's why it's built into a suitcase um yeah i mean that one I don't, I don't know it's when you go into the history of those kinds of instruments what i love about um you know like i said earlier with analog instruments in particular um is that there's still this sense of them being an instrument i think when things changed a bit when MIDI came into the picture. And I don't think there's anything wrong with MIDI. I don't think there's anything inherently good or bad about any type of gear or instrument. I think it's just what works better for people, for particular types of people, you know. But from my perspective, I think that things became a bit different with MIDI and as things moved more into the digital world, which which happens in all instrument design, is that it, it starts to become more standardized. It starts to become, you know, it's the same, like I was saying, with Renaissance instruments moving into the modern orchestras, that they wanted things to be more flexible. They wanted them to be more reliable. They wanted them to have more dynamic variation and things that, you know, you could just do more with it. And I think that's kind of the... Um, space that MIDI filled is that, you know, we don't want 10 instruments that can only do one very specialized thing. We want one, you know, interface that can connect to all these different things and just that's all that you need, you know, to have it be more versatile and more flexible. And for me, the way that I work, I like very much to interact with specific instruments and I, I see them as being like individuals, you know, like I said, with organs that they're each different. And I feel like analog instruments in particular, analog electronic instruments, um, still retain that quality. And so when you look at these um, earlier instruments, you can see not just in the specific instruments, but even in the manufacturers that the way that they were doing things was just different, you know, and, and so you would find yourself gravitating towards particular types of instruments just based on the way that EMS did things versus the way that Moog did things versus the way that ARP did things, you know. So it's a very personal response to the way that all these basic features that all synthesizers share have been um, expressed in particular instruments. And for me, I mean, there's part of it that's just the way that EMS 
the story of EMS and the way that they marketed themselves, I think is really interesting. Um, in the same kind of frame of mind that Buchla was doing things, which is always to be a little bit more alternative, whereas Moog and ARP were kind of like, you know, catering to professionals. Mm. Um, I feel like Buchla and EMS were kind of catering to artists a little bit more, um, or people who are interested in exploring or saw synthesizers as opportunities to explore. Uh, yeah, and so um, the synthy has just always been, uh, you know, an instrument that makes sense to me and that sounds the way that I want it to and, and behaves the way that makes sense for my music. So, yeah, it was it's, it's never really been a complicated decision. Uh, it's a, It seems, yeah, I, in a way I was like, ah, you know, the, the synthy seems so kind of like your music feels so carefully constructed and controlled that it felt like a sort of, uncontrolled you know it's sort of the the legend of the aks is it's sort of a you know an uncontrollable kind of beast uh, but mm. of course it is amazing at producing sort of droning textures and you know sort of soundscapes yeah i mean i think you could say the same thing about bukla instruments too I and mean, again i think that was kind of the difference is that they were um a little bit more exploratory in their approach whereas when you played a moog or when you played an arp especially it was like um like this surgical precision you know things were very they did it exactly what you wanted them to and that's why you know the moog ended up in like dance music and mm. sequenced types of music that worked really well for that type of um you know metered precision um but yeah i mean there are always ways that you can fine tune those kinds of things and again that's kind of an interesting way of getting to know the instrument is is being able to see what it can do and then being able to kind of take steps back from that and kind of get more specific with the sound if you had to you know if there's a fire what are you what are you taking <laughs> what's the synth that you're taking and perhaps organ as well difficult to take the organ of course but <laughs> yeah. let's say it's yeah possible. i would <laughs> I mean, I guess I would have to take the synthy less for sentimental value and mostly monetary value because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I could to help rebuild could the studio live off of it yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, rebuild life anyway. Yeah, but I mean, I don't know. It's a hard question. I mean, those ones again in particular, they're like really, um, they're just not things that you come across anymore. And I did, you know, I make no mistake, I paid for mine, but I didn't pay anything near what people pay today yeah. for them um, I mean I got mine like almost 10 years ago now um, and I bought it from a friend so yeah it's uh I would I would be foolish <laughs> let's say that yeah let, that let's way. say that's a given and it's been saved sure and beyond the AKS what you know what is the I suppose the question is like what synth is the most indispensable to your actual music making I use a bunch of different ones that I wouldn't say, I, th I think they just like work better for particular projects. So another one that I used a lot, um, even on like Gave and Rest, I think is the last time I used it, is the Steiner EVI, mm. which I have one of the later, so Krumar, I think, took over in like 1979 or 1980. Um, and I have one of those ones, which has the built-in synth. So it has a single oscillator synth in it, basically. And then it has the EVI um, controller. And uh, my particular one actually was owned by Vladimir Yusachevsky. Oh, wow, which is my goodness. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> I always kind of forget that. But um, yeah, it's just like, a, I don't even like his music really, but um, Still, I think it's funny. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. You know, it, it has a bit of historical value, I guess. Can you describe the, the EVI just for, for those who don't know? I mean, I only have a cursory understanding of it, to be honest. Yeah, so I think it's so there is the EWI or the EWI or the EWI, um, and then the EVI or the EV. I don't know what the correct, correct pronunciation is. I always say EV and EWI. But uh, anyway, so the yeah, the EV I think is the lesser common one. Um, the EWI is the electronic wind instrument, and the EV is the electronic valve instrument. Um, and so they were just designed. You know, like I said earlier, that um, the keyboard is just like an interface that's been attached to so many instruments um, because it's really intuitive and it's easy to use and whatever. Um, and so the synthesizer, of course, got the keyboard attached to it just for that purpose, um, but it was it didn't need to have a keyboard. And so um, Niall Steiner, who was a trumpet player, he was like a session trumpet player, I think, in Los Angeles or somewhere. He wanted to design a synthesizer controller that worked better for his way of playing that wasn't mm. keyboard-based, but that was valve based on um, brass instruments. And so, yeah, mine just has three buttons on the top to imitate the different valves. It uses the same fingering um, as those instruments. 
and uh, it has like a bell. The bell kind of thing on the bottom is actually a thing that you turn that changes the register or the octave of it. Um, and then when you blow into it, um, it's basically like a filter. So again, if you overblow, it'll just add in more harmonics. Mm. It's just like changing the resonance filter on a synth. Um, and it's a weird instrument. I'm not a brass player. I don't know the fingering. I had to figure it out and I probably you know don't do it right when I play it, but it's an interesting like solo kind of instrument. You know, a lot of the other synthesizers that I revere, there was another one that I was going to mention, um, which is a Korg PS3100. Oh, okay, great. Um, yeah. There are these very, yeah, these very like lush polyphonic instruments, which are really good. They're like organs, you know, they're really good for doing chords and, you know, very um, intervallic harmonic things. But um, the EV is just like a really nice solo kind of instrument that, maybe I like because I don't normally do that kind of music. So it's fun to play for me. Have you played the DX7 with the breath controller? I have not. I have a DX7 actually that was apparently owned by somebody who was on U2's um, like crew Amazing. a long time ago. I don't know. I've tried Googling. His name is like etched into the back of it. And I tried looking him up once, but I didn't find anything about him. What's your feeling on the DX7? I don't know. It, so the DX7 is definitely one of the instruments that I bought. I mean, I got mine for like 50 bucks, you know, so it's like whatever. But it's one of the instruments that I own that is more like that's if I'm going to own a digital synth, that's the one mm. to own, you know, something that's more like historical or some oh, sort of like five. filling out. High five. That, yeah. That's actually the reason I bought a <laughs> DX7 for the exact same reason. It was just like, yeah, I need to. I, I love this instrument and I need to own it for historical reasons for my little museum. Because it's important. Uh, what it did, it's a very important instrument. Oh yeah, and it sounds great. You know, if you, I don't know how to program it because um, I haven't spent the time figuring it out. Um, but if you move beyond the presets, it's actually a really. It sounds really incredible um, when you actually do the programming on it and and get you know sort of non-standard sounds, um, which I think are only standard now because we've heard them in recordings. You know, yeah. I don't think it's a fault of the instrument. I think it's just overuse of the instrument. And, but the uh, and you've got yeah the PS thirty one hundred is that's um well that's an instrument uh, and a half. <laughs> what yes, um, it is? Can you talk a bit about that? Like I I've sort of seen I've been to Adrian Utley's place from Porter's Head and he's got I think he has the slightly bigger one. I've I've yeah, seen, there's the thirty two hundred and the thirty three hundred. Yeah, I have a very sort of basic understanding of it, except to understand that it is from another a bit like the CS eighty. It's from a a world where there was obviously some corners, but relatively few corners were cut in order to make something possible that really probably was only possible through sheer brute force of, you know, financial investment that like there are literally like every key, isn't it completely every key produces a note? It is. Like, yeah. And it's just mm -hmm. wild. It's not, and it's not divide, divide down, is it? It's, it is. It is yeah. It's down. the same. Yeah, it's the same way the Polymoog works, okay. all of those all right. fully okay, polyphonic well, ones. Yeah, maybe yeah. that's a bit more sensible. Do you know what I mean? I thought for a second it was literally like a complete voice for every 48, you know. No, no, no. It's still impressive. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As even, or not just for the time, but like even now to have that, um, yeah, is really impressive. I do have a Polymoog as well, but that's the instrument that I've probably owned the longest. I bought it in like 2000 eight mm. nine maybe and it's moved around a lot it's kind of taken a bit of a beating yeah so i don't use it because i don't think it works it needs some work it's it's not working I think they, then they all need a little bit of work well you know the funny thing is that if you get them fixed and you take care of them and you know you use them that's the thing that i think people don't understand about these instruments too is that you have to use them in order to keep them in good shape they think that you know oh it's it's so fragile i shouldn't touch it shouldn't use it it should just sit you know in a shelf and never be played um that will deteriorate it it actually helps it to stay you know it's like exercising that you need to keep it active um every once in a while to actually keep it functioning properly but yeah if you take care of them i mean my synthy was fixed i don't know maybe like five years ago and it's still fine mm. and that was before i was touring and traveling around with it and it's it's still you know it's built like a beast yeah those, i mean <laughs> it hasn't yeah they were i guess they were built with 
parts that well, they were built to last. And a lot of these synths, you know, as I'm sure you know from like when you pop the, like the DX7 is a good example. If you unscrew it, the whole panel is hinged and like the whole thing mm. presents its internal guts for servicing because it was, mm-hmm. these instruments are made to be serviced and lasted and they're meant to be used by professional musicians. And as such, they were professionally meant to be serviced and kept running. It's uh, you know, obviously that is still a thing, but I think it's, I don't think we see synths with like hinges. Do you know what I mean? That like, yeah. open up anymore. <laughs> That's, but they are service, you know, synths are serviced and that is a thing, but it's, it just feels like a slightly different world. I agree. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't know. I think it's, it's true with a lot of, again, like in this time of sometime in the eighties where things kind of switched into this idea of like, you know, planned obsolescence, like let's build things to not to last and then people will buy more of them when they die. You know, it's like this weird marketing campaign kind of project. Although at least I suppose also just to make things more affordable so that, yeah, you sell more I suppose, of them. I yeah. guess it's that too. It's um Yeah. What um you know, if you were sort of starting out again, what would you what would you buy? Wow. Um I don't know. I mean, I kind of I kind of have everything that I want. At least in terms of synths, I would say maybe the only other thing that I would want um is like a nice string synth. I don't mm. really have anything like a dedicated like a Selena or something like that would yeah. be nice. Um but yeah, I mean, if I was starting out again, I don't know. Um, the instrument that I kind of learned how to play synthesizers on um, in like a meaningful way uh, was a Prophet 5. And um, I actually have one that's at my parents' house, unfortunately. I haven't been able to, I don't know how to get it here. <laughs> I just haven't had the time to pack it up or anything like that. Um, so I don't know, I guess maybe if I was starting out again, I don't know, maybe I'd, I'd go straight to that. It was just recently, that was probably the most recent synth that I bought. Um, yeah, I'd probably go straight to that and kind of start from there or maybe start collecting modules, like vocal modules or something mm. like that, which are outside of my my range now. Yeah. <laughs> what, what What is it about the Prophet 5? That's a synth I'm not, I've never really played on one, I don't even think. Oh, they're great. I mean, you know, it's the same kind of um, idea with the PS3100 is that they're just these really incredible and lush um, polyphonic synths. For me, I don't know, the Prophet 5, it's just, it it's kind of has the best of both worlds, you know, that it sounds really incredible. Um, but the things that it can do, like a lot of the modulation stuff that it can do, um, is not just, I think, more... Um, interesting to work on on the profit five but it's also more like streamlined it's sort of you know it's it's interesting when you think of instruments like the ps3100 that they come from this era um you know like in the mid late 70s when people were getting bigger and bigger with their polyphonic synths or that design was almost getting over the top you know it was like making these instruments that were really these um giant you know um objects of Mm complete overwhelming sound you know that it was going towards this direction and then it kind of dived in a different direction um, when people started to take advantage of digital control over the instruments which is what is happening in the profit five and it kind of took a step back from that and went back into this idea of like let's make things a little bit more streamlined so it's easier for people to get closer to the sounds that they want so they're not getting bogged down and all of these dials and switches and things like that yeah um, yeah, so I think the Prophet 5, and that's why it was so successful, I would say maybe after the DX7, it was, um, at least at that time, one of the more successful instruments, that yeah, that's why it kind of prevailed um, uh, over instruments like the PS3100 or whatever, um, is because it had that nice combination of like the sound, the analog sound, but then this easier way of working, you know. So do you, what sort of things do you do with it? Is it kind of... You are doing kind of drones or are you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's all <laughs> drones. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the other instruments that I was using um, early on that I would also tour with a lot um, is the Pro 1, which is the monophonic, essentially the monophonic version of the Prophet 5. Um, and both of those instruments, yeah, I mean, I think of them as being kind of the same, except the Prophet 5 has five voices right so um you can just do more um with chords and things like that but yeah for me they're just really good at creating that um those really slow moving drones the oscillations of things that are just really um 
they have enough stability to be usable, which a lot of the older modular stuff doesn't necessarily have. You know, to like play it in a live context is kind of a nightmare. But they have enough fluctuation that they still get that really um, almost acoustic quality mm. to them. The kind of beating, do you mean? Or- yeah, or even, you know, it's just like really minor like phasing between yeah. the oscillators just to get that movement of it um, is nice. Mm. Do you have like um, modular stuff as well? Have you? I don't. I don't own any. Yeah, the Synthi uh, is the closest mm. just because it's patchable. But no, I mean, again, like price-wise, that stuff has always been outside of my, my territory. Um, and I also... Uh, You know, again, I kind of subscribe to the idea that like everything has its function and has its use and there's no good or bad instrument, you know. But for me, I've never found myself interested in the Eurorack world, Mm. which is maybe an unpopular opinion. But it doesn't, it's not out of any like snobbery or anything like that. I don't know. It's it's just, there's something about the older instruments the the older modules that is so like wildly um not unpredictable but like it just like living you know like this thing that moves and breathes on its own that i think you just can't really recreate digitally um or even in like a modern analog sense i think they're just there's too much stability there's too much um control over things Mm. you know and i find that in a lot of the eurorack stuff that i have tried out it just it's not it's not the same even like in the modern um bukla music easels it's just it's it's there's no comparison to the original sound um although of course i understand that they serve a function in being more affordable (laughs) for people right so if that was the path i wanted to go down then yeah that would definitely be where i would would want to be using stuff but yeah it's it's just never really been a niche that i've found myself interested in it's interesting yeah it's the stability aspect. i mean it's yeah it's there is certainly there are modules that are designed to have their own instability i mean there are modules that mm. kind of have an id you know there are things that mm. literally almost have the circuits that have their own kind of like mind but i think it's that sort of um i don't know it's sort of i, I think about the you know your music and it's uh, it, there's a sense of sort of purity and simplicity but where you've you've you're i feel one of my issues with eurac and i have a lot of it and it's sort of what i'm known for is like making videos about eurac and stuff and it's yeah it is that thing that it's eurac is the antithesis of um an instrument in a sense Mm. which is ironic Mm -hmm. because you can use it to produce instruments you can make your own dream instrument and you could make a drone instrument but it's that idea that it would always potentially change and therefore you could never master it because you will always be compelled to change it whereas a synthy aks hasn't changed since 1968 (laughs) or whatever and um yeah and but then also it's just you know it's that thing of like having less instruments and working harder to get more out of them is, you know, and I, as I listen to your music, it's sort of, um, it's why I was sort of asking that question about simplicity earlier is sort of, you know, I was kind of thinking in terms of simplicity as regards what is necessary to record. It's like that idea of like, you know, if you only have an organ, you're going to, you're not going to be worrying about, you know, um, obvious organs have tone shaping controls that you may want to adjust as part of performance, but you're not, mm-hmm. you're not going down this sort of rabbit hole of I've got 10 million combinations of these modules. Um, what am I going to do today? It's more about then working hard to find pleasing chord structures and, uh, you know, things that are maybe more traditional in a music sense, but possibly more satisfying as an end result. You know, I don't know if that rings true. Oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think that that touches on a few things that I I feel about those instruments, not just analog instruments, but like older acoustic instruments like I was saying earlier that there's this, you know, idea that modern ones are are better or whatever, um which I don't think is the case that yeah, I mean a lot of the instruments that I've found more interest in are ones that are more simplistic and I think even when you think of analog synthesizers compared to um 
you know, what you have today with computers and your Iraq and all the options that you have. Um, they're definitely more simplistic in the sense that they are like acoustic instruments, that they're self-contained instruments that do have, you know, they're maybe more flexible than a piano, but they still have limitations. A synthy at the end of the day is still going to sound like a synthy. And again, I think it, it goes back to, to that idea um, you know, with different manufacturers creating these things that you can hear. I mean, maybe it's more specific, but I think you can hear when music's been made on a particular type of instrument, especially ones that do things that other ones can't. Um, you know, like with a Moog, for instance, again, being connected to dance music or something like that, you'd never hear, uh, you know, a bukla or whatever being on that. It would be used for a different function because of, you know, its affordances and what it can do. And yeah, that's always been interesting to me. But like I say, I don't, I don't really see analog electronic instruments as being in this separate category from acoustic instruments in that sense. It's just that they're, they're very similar in a lot of ways to me. And yeah, a big part of that is that um, simplicity, but also the depth that you can go into them. I think when you know when you do have a lot of choices, you tend to overlook things that are special that are. Um, you know, just things that you wouldn't necessarily have time to look at or things that you wouldn't, um, that would seem more basic or whatever than other things. Like even just taking a basic synthesizer, like even on a Pro 1 or something, and just looking at the oscillators and just hearing how the different waveforms sound and comparing it to the way that they sound on the Korg PS3100 or whatever, mm. you know, and having that difference in quality that is just something I think gets overlooked a lot. Mm. People seek to overcomplicate things. It's just like you can just enjoy the difference between those things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, even with a piano, I don't know, you know, there are certain things that are just on the surface level, even if you're not preparing the piano or whatever, you're just playing it the way that a piano is uh, intended to be played. There are a lot of details in it that you can um, venture toward without needing to get complicated. So... If you took on a student, <laughs> this is such a cheesy <laughs> question, but it's, I think it's interesting. There's a reason. Uh, if you took on a student, what would be the first lesson you would teach them? Hmm. I mean, I always think that people, like musicians especially, should listen to as much music as possible. Like, not even before they do anything, but even while they're working. Like, you should just always be listening to different types of music um, and listening for details. And I think I've always, I always think of myself as being like on this producer's end of listening the way that a producer might listen to a recording or might listen to an instrument or a microphone or whatever. And so that's usually the way that I would want people to think about sound is trying to listen to these details and just, you know, listening to any kind of recording and trying to think about, you know, what are you actually hearing? And then when you go a step towards making it, um, think about, you know, how would that have been done? Um, and kind of trying to go backwards from the sound or deconstruct a little bit. But even, you know, if you're playing an instrument, if you have somebody who has a basic oscillator or something, um, to just listen to it, you know, to just listen to things, to not, to like really take time and listen to them um, and not just move on to the next thing, but really think about that sound quality. And, and you know, you could try making minute changes to things and, and really try to absorb what that sound is like. Um, Cause I, yeah, I think people just aren't patient anymore. I don't know if I'm not old enough. I think, I think I'm in this weird generation <laughs> where I'm old enough to know that things have changed, but too young to know what things were like before. Mm. Um, and I don't know if people always had this level of like impatience with things, but I've noticed it more that you know people just don't they don't have the uh appreciation of listening to something which is weird because you know you can go to an art museum and it's not strange to stare at a painting for like a minute um but for some reason people get really uncomfortable with static sounds or things that are seemingly static because a painting is not static right you're not you can't capture all of it at one time you can only look at certain things and then you have to take a longer time to actually get all the details of the painting and I think listening is similar, that you're not going to capture everything that's happening right at that moment. You'll catch the obvious things like the pitch, right? So when it goes to another pitch, then you get a sense of melody. And that's what is really easy for people to latch onto in music. But um, there's so much behind it that people don't really listen to that they're just kind of missing out on, mm. I think. 
deeper listening is required. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. No, it's, yeah. it's true, and it's. Uh, and I mean, as you say, it's not unusual to spend a minute li- looking at a painting. I, I will disagree. I think it's actually, in my experience, <laughs> it depends. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it is unusual, which is a bit of a problem, really. Like people don't yeah. dwell and and stare at you know people. Um, my wife works in a gallery education and I can't remember the stat, but it's like that's been worked out as, you know, the amount of time that people spend on each picture is something ridiculous, like 10 seconds or, mm, you know, wow. so it's, yeah, I don't know. I wonder if it's the, perhaps, yeah, the advent of modern technology and the very fact that we can skip music. It's the very fact that there is a skip button that mm-hmm. didn't exist you know when you're looking at the music from the 1400s and 1500s it was mm-hmm. music was never a recorded experience of course it was something that could yeah. only be experienced live and so there was a sense of occasion and I, I can't imagine what it must have been like to have an interest in music at that time you know to to say you loved a certain piece you may only have heard it twice in yeah. your life do you know what I mean isn't that yeah. weird yeah yeah yeah, I think about that all the time. I mean, that's a really interesting, the idea of how recording has changed just the way that we listen and the way that we make music and the way that we think about sound, you know, that's such a an interesting um, topic. And I think, you know, music probably has changed. Like, I think the idea of music, you know, pieces of music as being these like unmovable things like there's this you know there's the song there's this song that exists and that's what you think of when you listen to it and we have a sense of how it can change today because we have live versions and we have bootlegs and covers and whatever so we can understand the variation um but i think that idea of like this you know this like type token kind of thing that we have now didn't exist before the 20th century where it was like and it, it, that created all sorts of other problems of like, you know, the piece is the score or whatever, where people needed to have this like one version of it that they somehow held above everything else. But if you go, yeah, earlier back, like in the, the Baroque, even in the Renaissance, it was just like music was just this thing that existed and you could um, play with it in different ways. And it didn't need to adhere to this specific idea of what it was supposed to be, which I think is interesting. Mm. It's kind of the antithesis of what I do with my own music, maybe, but um, I still think it's interesting. But then you do perform your music live and it's and it then therefore has to be a kind of malleable entity that sort of. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh yeah, like I said, a lot of my music on my records I just don't play live because partly because I can't. I mean in large part because I can't. Um but also partly because I don't I don't want to try. I think it would remove something of the actual piece to try to put it into a different context so part of me just likes to let it be what it is and then the opposite of that when i'm playing live i like to do things that i can't do on records you know have especially with duration and things like that um and with acoustics um to play with things that you just can't capture on a record and i think you know respecting those two different domains and ways of listening is um something that i care about what is it? What do you do live? What? How does it differ? And what, what does the show look like? I mean, it varies. Like I said, I mean, there are some pieces that I can do live. So yeah, there's probably a handful of pieces that if I wanted to, I could play live. Although, um, especially the stuff from earlier albums is on these older instruments. So I would have to take them out. So, you know, it'd have to be like a local show or something. Um, And then a lot of the stuff on Cantus Descant, um, again, because of the way that it came about that I needed to be in the space and I was working with these organs directly, that it it came out of performance, right? Um, So I could play those live, um, although I'd need to adapt them to different instruments. Um, But yeah, I mean, when I tour now, it's just uh, I use a Nord and then a bunch of pedals and the Nord is actually... I, I hate the way it looks. I think it's like really Funky red thing. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I get why they did it, but I don't like it at all. Um, but it sounds pretty good, actually. Mm. That's the nice thing about digital simulations of things now is that it's been so long that they're actually they actually sound pretty good now. Um, they don't sound, you know, cheesy or whatever mm. like they did in the early nineties. And it has, you know, it has an organ, electric organ. Um, It has a lot of Mellotron samples, which I use a lot, and, you know, some synthesizer samples and things like that. Um, But yeah, when I play live, it's mostly that's the sound source. And then I have one pedal that's a looping pedal. um, And then a couple other pedals, one that kind of adds tape saturation, and then another one that does um, like sound on sound tape loops. It's a delay pedal, but it does sort of shorter tape loops. 
yeah, and it's just kind of, it's not improvised. Um, I mean, it's improvised when I figure it out at home before I, I play it. But uh, yeah, it's usually just like a single long evolving thing, which I really like doing because again, I can't, I can't do a 50 minute thing on a record that's just continuous, you know? Mm. But so you are composing new music for the live scenario, or is that just an approach is like, you know, design a kind of 50 minute progression using the Nord and these pedals? No, it's always something new. I mean, the last, uh, I guess it's a weird time to talk about it now because I'm not doing it right now. Um, but last year, uh, you know, like at the beginning of the year, which is when I got the Nord, um, I created this set, um, which I basically just played out throughout the whole year. Um, so if I had been touring, my plan was to make a new set for this new set of shows. Mm. Um but yeah, it's usually, you know, like every six months or a year or something. It kind of depends. Like if I'm going back to the same place, then obviously I, I would want to play a different set. Um, or if it's something specific, like I do a lot of performances with um, like chamber ensembles, like strings or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and so those are always specific, usually to the that performance that I write out. Um, and then again, organ stuff is, you know, usually like I, I travel with my notebook or whatever. So I have my my scores of things that I know I I want to do at some point, but I, I usually um, create the piece like during my sound check, essentially, um, where I'll work with that particular organ and figure out the registration stops on it um, and then create that specific piece just for that organ. Then and there at the venue. So mm -hmm. it is kind of yeah. improvised, but with a little pre prep. Yeah, it's, I mean, I write it out when I'm working on it. Um, you know, it's the nice thing about playing uh, an organ is that you don't have to do a sound check, um, that you literally can just walk up to it and play it. But um, so I spend that time working on the piece. So I'll have my, again, like my specific um, passages that I know I want to play. But just because each instrument, you know, it has a different number of manuals, different types of stops that I want to be able to figure out all of that and know how that's happening. I don't want to be playing around with that while I'm performing. I want to know um, what's going on before. You know, when I do like full electronic sets, I mean, again, I have the set kind of written out that I take from from show to show. Um, but there's still room within that. Like it's it's I guess I have like, you know, goal posts in my performance of like, you know, at this time you want to kind of be doing this thing yeah. and then doing this thing. And so within that, I can kind of respond to the way that the audience is, if it feels like it should go slower or faster through different things or the way that the space is reacting. So yeah, those are like real time things that you can kind of work out in a sound check, mm. but you just, you get better at doing it in performances as well. It's interesting. That there's that thing where rooms resonate at certain frequencies as well, isn't there? That, mm -hmm. that kind of the whole like, like makes your ears go. Can weird. be very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose then I have a final question, which is a question I've asked every podcast. But um, for you, what is the future of music technology, or you know, what is the thing that that would help you the most that doesn't exist? I feel for yourself, it, the opposite feels like the question. It should be, what from the past should we remember the most? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And yeah, if if it was the former question, I probably wouldn't know how to <laughs> answer it. And I probably I don't. Yeah, I don't really think in that way that I'm not really looking to like, what can I make or what needs to fill this void? I'm, I'm more interested in finding ways to make other things work. Um, yeah, I mean, I think just as general, you know, you mentioned a bit earlier, this idea of simplicity. And I think that's definitely something is is being able to look at instruments that are seemingly simple um, and to be able to see beyond that, you know, and to be able to see complexity within that or, um, you know, detail within that. But yeah, even just this idea of like making things work, you know, I think you can learn a lot about your process and about how you want to make music, even if it's not something that you end up using as music, but to even just be able to sit down with something, an instrument that you didn't think you would want to play, um, like for me, for instance, when I came back to the piano and tried to figure out how to make it work for me, to be able to overcome that idea of the instrument and what we've been taught to think a piano is supposed to do and sound like and what it's associated with and all these kinds of things. And to, yeah, to take time with these instruments because there's so much that exists. There's so many options already. And it kind of feels like, you know, when people aren't getting, again, like this immediate satisfaction from something, they just chuck it away and move on to the next thing and they want something new and something different um 
And I think, yeah, you can, you can teach yourself some lessons about listening and patience and listening. If you actually take the time to explore things that have been left behind. <laughs> nice. Thank you. That was great. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank you. That's fun. Yeah. There, you have it. Thank you, Sarah. Holy heck, what a cool person. And what a good chat. Oh, my goodness. It's, uh, yeah, that thing about the whole the lost instruments really, it sort of makes me feel both sad and intrigued to think about what those instruments are and what could we learn. But ultimately, that thing she says about it's about listening more intently and more carefully, and you don't need to do so much as such, if I'm interpreting that in the correct way. Listen more intently, and you will discover beauty in the details. It's like staring at a flower, you know, you stare at anything for long enough, you learn to appreciate more depth. There are more two things if you look carefully. And her music exemplifies that. So I highly recommend that you purchase her music, of course, as we did that. Um, that is what will benefit Sarah the most. And Sarah's music is all on Bandcamp. SarahDavachi.bandcamp.com. D-A-V-A-C-H-I. Davachi. Davachi. Davachi, I think. SarahDavachi.bandcamp.com. There is... Cantus Descant, which is the album that we were talking a bit about, which is beautiful. She is just releasing, will be releasing Figures in Open Air, which is like a double disc, um, which is promising. There's only six tracks and it's a double disc. And that means they are really lovely and long, which is exactly what I like to hear. <laughs> and these are all live versions of tunes that she has played, which is going to be really interesting. That's what I kind of, I'd, I'd love to hear more of a live music because it's clear that the live, the playing experience in a live setting, she she has that improvisational side to it. So it's going to be, a you know, an extended, um, more, you know, deeper cut than, you know, you might be tempted to put on a record. But speaking of records, I would highly recommend her records. I personally, when I was like looking through and I, I bought a couple of records I bought Let Night Come On, Bells End the Day. And I also bought Verges. I was a bit drawn to the Let Night Come On, Bells End of the Day because on Bandcamp she says it was composed with electric organ, acoustic piano, Mellotron, Synthie AKS, and then that Steiner EV, EV, or whichever one, the one that she was talking about. So I was kind of intrigued by the ones that, that kind of obviously had... Uh, synthesizers on but what you will be struck by is the fact they don't sound like synthesizer music if that makes sense they are filled with texture they are slow and meditative and warm and enveloping tunes um and i'd be very happy if they were all like five times longer i might stick them through pull stretch um, and then the other one is Verges, as I said, and Verges I was drawn to because that's the one where she uses the EMS Synthy 100 that was belonged to someone that she knew. Um, and it has violin and voice as well, but also just gorgeous, long music that you can... And this is hypocr hypocritical, especially because we were talking about this with BT, you know, the whole thing of it's a shame about music that is, you know, on while you do something else, but... I do think it's, I think a powerful, powerful feature of drone is how it can hold and envelop you for a longer amount of time. And it can, it can help you relax. It can help you <laughs> meditate and, you know, and slow down. Um, and it's the kind of music that, I don't know, there's a sort of like a contradiction because you could say just as well, it's the perfect music bathe you while you do something and focus on an activity or calm down or meditate or something like that. But similarly, it is also the music to put on a pair of headphones in a dark room and focus on nothing but the music. 
And I suppose in a sense, both of those things can be done at the same time. Either way, it makes me feel very nice when I listen to it. And that is what music is for. Um, So her music is wonderful. Check it out. Thank you, Sarah, for giving your time very kindly to speak to me on this podcast. And um, thank you to our sponsors. By golly, Signal Sounds for all your signal sounding, i.e. music equipment needs, signalsounds.com. Thank you also to Skillshare, who have that link that's below if you want to try Skillshare out. There are loads of really wicked lessons and useful things that you can teach yourself. That is a great thing. You can teach yourself some stuff that you've been wanting to learn more about. What is not to like about that? Level up your skills and your brain uh, with some new thoughts. And in all, thank you for listening. Please. Tell your friends about this podcast and thank you. I will see you next time. Be well.